The Tom Woods Show, episode 1909. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, don't even think about missing the libertarian event of the year, the 2000th episode of The Tom Woods Show, live in Orlando, featuring many of your favorites from The Tom Woods Show. And Michael Malice says his special surprise guest whose identity I myself don't even know, will bring the house down. Cost nothing to attend. Register at TomWoods2000.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. As some of you know, I have been doing a cartoon series with our friend Michael Malice called The Politically Incorrect Guide with the blessing of Regnery Publishing, which publishes the book series, The Politically Incorrect Guide. I was the author of the first book in that series. As some of you know, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, And each month, Michael and I, or the cartoon versions of ourselves, explore some interesting topic. And in tandem with the release of these episodes, I like to feature the author of the relevant entry in the Politically Incorrect Guide series. So we did an episode recently on communism, which was very funny. I enjoyed the communism episode. I'll link to it on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1909. So Michael and I talked about communism in that episode. So I thought, all right, let's get the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism, that particular volume in the series, because the idea is the cartoon is loosely based on the series of books. So I take each episode as an opportunity to highlight that particular book in the series here on the podcast. And Paul Kenger, who is a professor at Grove City College, is the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism, and we're going to talk to him today. Paul, welcome to the show. Tom, it's great to be with you. I've I've read your stuff for many years, going back to your uh, politically incorrect guide and and your book on the, the Catholic Church and Western civilization. So it's good to finally be on your show. I appreciate the invite. Well, thank you very much. Very glad to have you. All right. Well, we're just going to scratch the surface of your politically incorrect guide to communism today, and maybe people will find that it's a nice, punchy, meaty introduction to the subject for folks who need to know more, who want some good talking points, who want to understand it better. Also for a younger audience who might not be able to get through a dense book like, let's say, Richard Pipes' series on the Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution and stuff like that. I think Richard Pipes is fantastic, but I wouldn't. that wouldn't be the first book I would hand to somebody. So I, I like right. that you've done this. Very helpful. You know, if, if I may make a, a recommendation, so Pipes has a shorter book. Oh, A called, Concise History of the Russian Revolution. I love that book. That is that what you mean? It, well, he also has Communism, A History, which was done by a modern library. It's under 200 pages. I use it in, one of, in my Marxism course at Grove City College. And if I may make a shameless um, recommendation, I just did a book called The Devil and Karl Marx, which gets into some of the really ugly, religious, you know, diabolical, um, quite literally evil roots of uh, Marx and Marxist ideology. So there you go. All right, that's that's fantastic. There's there's so much that we can do, so you just have to forgive me for seeming to be arbitrary in how I jump around. But let's start off with the kind of claim and just see how you would address it that that people today who say because you you do still find some people today who call themselves Marxists, of course, and, and maybe more and more of them. And when you bring up to them the kinds of arguments in this book that look in actual practice, this has led to nightmarish results, they come back at you with, but that's that's not real communism. Right, yeah, I hear it all the time, constantly. In fact, um, in my most recent book, I quote a Marx biographer named Francis Wien, who says that it would be, a, it would be absurd to blame Karl Marx for the gulags and the death and destruction and everything else. And, and it's really not absurd at all Because if you come up with a philosophy, a manifesto, as Marx and Engels did in 1848, and you write there the entire communist theory or program may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property, I mean, right then and there, it's kind of a non-starter. I I mean, you know, my my 10-year-old daughter could come up to you and say, Daddy, they're going to have to kill people, aren't they, to do that, right? And and when when you just walk through the manifesto, the 10-point plan, what they're calling for, and you'll find different Marxists here and there online who say, well, they don't really really want to do away with private property. Actually, Marx and, and Engels double down on that. 
they follow up that line. They say, um, so you are horrified with us saying that we intend to do away with private property. And there, Tom, they don't stop and say, well, that's not really what we mean. They say, no, that is precisely what we intend to do. And of course, if you look at different communist countries and regimes, they took that quite literally. I, a former student of mine told me about his aunt and uncle in Cuba who were nearly arrested for taking mangoes from the mango tree that grew in their front yard because everything was the property of the state. You, you had no private property. So it, if you call for a philosophy, a theory, a program that's that revolutionary, I think, and Marx and Engels even say that at their 10 point, their 10 point plan, of course, in the beginning, despotic inroads will be necessary, unquote. They realize that you're going to need despotism. You're going to need a police state. You're going to need guns and gulags to implement something this radical and this contrary to human nature. I want to now immediately jump into specific examples. When I was in college, I had a professor, Vladimir Brovkin, who was an expert on the Mensheviks. And he was very insistent, even though I think his politics were probably social democratic left, but he was virulently anti-Bolshevik. Hmm. And he said in the class that he wanted to counter what he called the good Lenin, bad Stalin myth. Right. Can you do that too? Yeah, amen. And that used to be there in academia, the late Richard Pipes of Harvard. He spent a lot of, a lot of time too going against this, especially in his book in the 1990s on the real Lenin inside the Soviet archives. And it, it was the idea that Oh, you know, if, if only Lenin would have lived, if he didn't die in January 1924, he was around 53, I think, years old when, when he died. If only he had li lived, and then Stalin wouldn't have come into power, and all of this wouldn't have happened. But, but in fact, you know, Lenin put in place the entire totalitarian apparatus. He banned everything from free speech and right of assembly and freedom of religion to, to private property. You know, Lenin, there, there's a great quote by another Soviet historian who said something to the effect of Leninism would have created Stalinism in any event. I mean, the, the entire system was set up for whoever wanted to walk into it. And if you just read some of Lenin's writings, Lenin's letters are actually far more hateful and virulent and quite literally directly advocating of violence than almost anything you see written down by Stalin. I mean, you know, you know, hang, hang, hang without fail, the blood-sucking kulaks, vampires, leeches, parasites, you know, on, on and on and on. Hang without fail so that everybody all around will yell for 100 meters, uh, 100 kilometers. They are killing. They will kill the merciless kulaks. You know, yours, Lenin. Pipes and others said, in fact, Pipes quote, quotes a Bolshevik, I'm trying to remember who it was, Peter Struve, I think, a, a Lenin associate, who said something like, the chief feature of Leninism is hatred. You know, Lenin was a, was a vicious, hateful, nasty little man. And besides, it's not just Lenin or Stalin that killed a lot of people. Every, every communist country is like this. Some are worse than others. You know, Fidel Castro and Che, um, you know, only executed 15,000 to 18,000 people, right, as compared to like a million. You know, but 100,000 people attempted to swim from Cuba to the United States, according to the Harvard University Press book, The Black Book of Communism, between 1959 and 1999, and upwards of 40,000 died from drowning. So, you know, the actual number of people dead under communism in Cuba, R.J. Rummel did this estimate, a number of others, it's probably over 100,000 dead. And that's a lot of people in an island of just a few million people. And I have even talked about the greatest killing field of all. Well, what would that be? I guess the greatest killing field would be Pol Pot's Cambodia, where anywhere from one to three million people out of a total population of five to seven million died or were killed or starved to death in just four years between 1975 and 79. Or Mao's China, where the Black Book of Communism says 62, 65 million people died, and the latest research, over 70 million. 
So, I mean, you know, good Lenin, bad Stalin. Lenin put in place the Bolshevik regime, but became known as Marxism-Leninism. And that was emulated around the world. And it's, it's led to vast fields of death wherever it was tried. How is it possible for some people to defend Mao and actually view him as a great revolutionary leader in light of these numbers? I mean, are they, are they going to try to say that the deaths were caused by uh, forces outside his control, bad weather, stuff like that, the usual communist? Bad weather covers a multitude of sins in the <laughs> communist world. Yeah, it does. It does. And, and uh, you know, any famine, right, is due to bad weather. Of course, Stalin's collectivization in the Ukraine in the 1930s, which led to the deaths of about 5 to 10 million people, it's, it's known as Holodomor. And you know, that has been affirmed by many historians as an intentional famine. So as a form of genocide against the Ukrainian people. But if you break these numbers down, Tom, in different places, Arnold Beachman from the Hoover Institution looked at these numbers in the 1930s, a number of others. It's usually, take the Soviet Union, 10, 20, 30 million, 40 million, who knows? Alexander Yakovlev, Gorbachev's chief reformer, did a book for Yale University Press 2003, 2004, called A Century of Violence in Soviet Russia. Yakovlev said that, uh, quote, Stalin alone annihilated 60 to 70 million people, unquote. And that's among the higher numbers, but other people have used numbers like that. Solzhenitsyn used a number like that. But uh, Bishman and others looked at this. So actually, how did they die? Some of them by famine, some of the famine intentional, other famine maybe not intentional, but at the least due to the collectivization of agriculture. Many of them were killed by by gunshot wound, executed, purged. Uh, Again, the case of Cuba with Fidel and Che, a lot of people were executed by firing squad. People sent off to the Gulag concentration camps, as they were originally called by Lenin and Trotsky. They first used the term concentration camp, even before Hitler and the Nazis did. They were using that term in the 1920s. So people there exposed to the elements in Siberia, people who died from disease. So there's a whole bunch of other different factors involved, but it's easy to blame communism for this. I would even go so far as to argue, and these numbers are not included in any of the estimates. You look at the number of abortions in communist countries. What happened with abortion in the Soviet Union is unprecedented in the history of humanity. By the 1970s, Tom, this is according to to official Soviet health ministry statistics, seven to eight million abortions per year, per year in the Soviet Union. And abortion was being called for as early as the June 1913 edition of Pravda by Lenin, where he called for, quote, the immediate annulment of of all laws against abortion, the immediate unconditional annulment of all laws against abortion. So in communist countries, abortion has been off the charts. So that's that's not included in any of the statistics. But that's a whole other culture of death issue involved here. But it's, um, yeah, so that, those are just some of the ways that you get at understanding the numbers. Hey, folks, let's take a minute to thank our brand new sponsor, We the People Holsters. Now, I talk to you about razors and suitcases and men's suits and apps and all kinds of things. But if there's one item I know will appeal to the Tom Woods Show audience, it's gun holsters, for heaven's sake. We the People holsters are 100% American made, custom molded to fit your exact firearm for a quick, smooth draw. I've got one, by the way, and I am a fan of We the People holsters. With thousands of options to choose from, plus a selection of custom printed holsters, you're sure to find just the right fit for your lifestyle. Plus, their proprietary clip allows you to customize the cant and ride for a comfortable fit you can wear all day. But that's not all. Check out their complete line of patriotic shirts, their 100% American made tactical gun belt with the proprietary talon buckle and premium line of bacon jerky. Yes, you heard that right. Bacon jerky made from 100% American patriotic pigs. So show your support for the Tom Woods Show in this great American company. Go to wethepeopleholsters.com slash woods right now and get an additional 10% off with the offer code woods10. That's wethepeopleholsters.com slash woods using code woods10. wethepeopleholsters.com slash woods. Now, it's true that in this day and age, you don't really find that many people 
speaking expressly the old classical Marxist language of uh, abolishing private ownership of the means of production. But does that mean that therefore these ideas are dead? No, not at all. In fact, I have, um, it's posted right now, today is the lead piece of the American Spectator. I, I wrote a piece about Black Lives Matter's founder, Patrice Cullors. So Patrice Cullors, the founder of Black Lives Matter, she, she just put a video up online referring to herself as an abolitionist. <laughs> and, and she's calling for the abolition of not only the police, but prisons, jails, incarceration, surveillance, and the courts. And, and she's announced in this new video that she's posted up on her YouTube channel that she's producing an abolitionist handbook, as it's called. And I wrote a piece on this for the American Spectator because one thing that's very, very clear about Marx's writings and about communist writings, and I, I teach this in my Marxism course at Grove City College, is that probably the most common word that you can find in the writings of Marx and Engels is the word abolition or abolish. They would abolish not only private property, but the family. In fact, there's a, there's a line in the manifesto, abolition of the family, exclamation mark. Even the most radical flare up of this infamous proposal of the communists, unquote. They talk about abolishing all religion, all morality, entire states, classes, societies. Marx called for the ruthless criticism of everything that exists. <laughs> he said, communism, this is a direct quote from the Communist Manifesto. Communism seeks to abolish the present state of things. Abolish the present state of things. So this is a really radical revolutionary philosophy. And you know, kind of getting back to your original questions, how can anybody advocate for this today or believe in this or read this? I think most people don't actually read it. They they think that Marx, and in fact, I can tell you this, Tom, survey data bears this out. A lot of the polling done by Gallup, a big study by the Reason Foundation and Reason and Roop a few years ago, they will ask young people, Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation did this, they'll ask young people, um, do you support communism? Do you support socialism? And they'll get these really high numbers and then they'll ask them, well, how do you define communism? And they'll say things like, oh, well, it's about spreading the wealth. It's about people sharing. It's about people being kind to one another. It's about helping the poor. But, but no, what it really is, is this extraordinarily radical revolutionary philosophy that doesn't just talk about tinkering with markets or focus on classes. But you know, this is, Marx and Engels even understood, right? They, they said communism seeks, quote, the most radical rupture in traditional relations, unquote. They realized how revolutionary their philosophy was. And I think the problem with most people today who say that they support communism or say positive things about it, they don't actually understand what the ideology is, is all about. Okay, so that sort of answers my question. I, for one thing, I... I would say none of the self-described Marxist regimes I'm familiar with has lacked prisons or jails. I have not right. heard that as being part of their program. They're all too happy to fill the prisons and the jails. But the other thing would be, I guess what I'm driving at is somebody like, whether it's somebody from BLM or whatever, none of them are saying, well, the reason for economic cycles is because of the inherent contradictions of capitalism. None of them talk that way. None of them use the old Marxist language. So is the connection to Marxism simply the identification of irreconcilable warfare between groups in society? That, that is part of it. And really what's going on today is that Marxists, and you'll see this if you go to the website of uh, People's World, which is the publication, the successor to The Daily Worker, you go to the website of Communist Party USA, cpusa.org. A lot of what they're talking about has nothing to do with class and labor and unions. Most of it's cultural and a lot of it's sexual. In fact, the about section of People's World, I would encourage people to go look at that. They have a call there, Tom, for what they call cultural workers, cultural workers. So people to toil in the cultural vineyard. You know, they're not calling for West Virginia coal miners, right? You know, those people all voted for Trump. 
You know, they're not seeking, you know, my my relatives, the children of my relatives who grew up in the steel mills of Western Pennsylvania. They're not seeking farmers in the Midwest. Right now, they're engaging in culture and sexual stuff, marriage, family, gender. And of course, um, there are gender Marxists, there are feminist Marxists, there are um, you know, queer theorists, as they call themselves. So a lot of them are dealing with, with critical theory, critical race theory, what has historically been known as cultural Marxism. But now if you look it up on Google, they call it like something like a white nationalist conspiracy theory or some such nonsense. I wrote two or three articles on that point alone for American Spectator. And a commonality, this gets back, I think, to your question is, so there is a continuity, though, there with the original Marxism, and that's this. It's a matter of pitting people against one another. It's a matter of pitting groups against one another. So whereas in historical Marxism, classical Marxism, the proletariat would be both the victim group and the redeemer group that would usher in the revolution. And the goal of the vanguard, the regime, the anointed Marxists would be to enlighten and teach the proletariat that they are in fact the victim group that can serve as the redeemer group. Well, that's kind of all gone in modern <laughs> Western Marxism because you know, modern Marxists know that there's no proletariat, there's no class out there, there's no, there's no group of workers that are gonna get behind them and overthrow the capitalist regime. So Marxism today and ever since, and especially since the days of the Frankfurt School in the 1920s, 1930s, the critical theorists, Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, who was the guru of the 1960s New Left, even Wilhelm Reich, who wrote the book, The Sexual Revolution. They've been casting about ever since for new victim groups. So they look to race, they look to gender. The first time, Tom, that I saw the, the label LGBTQIA+, I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know what the IA stood for, was in people's world. In the early 2000s, I saw those guys advocating for same-sex marriage and the redefinition of marriage 10 years before Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton flipped on the issue. So Angela Davis, Herbert Marcuse's most famous pupil, uh, probably the most famous female Marxist in America, she wrote the foreword to Patrice Cullors' memoirs. Ilan Omar calls her her role model. You know, she All the time today when she writes and talks, she's not talking about class. She's talking about climate change, immigrants, trans people of color. Oh, and, um, and can, I, can I jump in on this, uh, this yeah, Angela please. Davis thing? Because I wrote a little bit about her when I was in college. And in fact, I ran into her at a Harvard commencement ceremony. I, I didn't wow. say anything, but I, I thought, oh my gosh, I think that's her. And I asked somebody, is that Angela Davis over there? And sure, I don't know why she was there. But <laughs> it, gave, I, it was creepy because I had written about her. Recently, when... Um, you know, the um, move to to abolish the police or, or whatever that, you know, defi- I beg your pardon, defund the police was, was getting going. I had a lot of people I was reading on the left saying we need to be listening to Angela Davis at a time like this when it comes to prison abolition because she's written about that. Now, it's pretty rich for Angela Davis to be talking about prison abolition when she was very well-liked among the regimes behind the Iron Curtain. She won the Lenin Peace Prize at one point. Right. And so a group of people approached her and said, we have some prisoners of conscience behind the Iron Curtain, and we know you have influence with those regimes. Maybe you could use some of your influence to get those people out of prison. And her answer was, they deserve what they get. Let them remain in prison. That's the woman you're looking to to talk about prison abolition. You would have to be out of your mind. <laughs> Right. Well, and and she is when there are pictures of her online meeting with Fidel Castro, meeting with Eric Honecker, who built the Berlin Wall. And and she received the Lenin Prize in the Soviet Union in 1979. In fact, if you go to YouTube and you type in video Angela Davis Lenin Prize 1979, you can watch her receiving it in a giant hall of white people, <laughs> right, of, of, of all of all Russians. And she is, um, yeah, you're right. She won't speak to that. And Patrice Cullors in this latest video, she refers to Angela Davis as a fellow abolitionist on the matter of police reform. Another good friend of both of theirs and a big inspiration to them is Asada Shakur. 
In fact, um, so I, I have right here at my desk, I have Patrice Cullors' um, memoirs right here. The forward is by Angela Davis, and the lead quote, the kind of uh, epigram, I think, if you will, is by Asada Shakur. And she was the, the, the woman, part of the Black Liberation Army, also affiliated with the Weather Underground, who got in a shootout with police on the New Jersey Turnpike, and a police officer was killed in the 1970s. She went to jail for that. She broke free out of jail, and she's been living for the past over 30 years, almost 40 now, since the early 1980s. She's been living um, protected in Castro's Cuba. And Asada Shakur, the, the lead quote here in Patrice Culler's book is, workers, you have, you have nothing to lose but your chains. It's a quote from Marx. So yeah, the idea that they'd be calling for, for police reform or the abolition of police when someone like Angela Davis was a fan of police state regimes, right, is, uh, is indeed very rich. All right. I know that you're under a bit of time pressure today, but I'm going to trespass on your time for one more question. Sure. And, and that is, you have a section in here about why people don't know. And they don't, by the way. I have interacted with an awful lot of people, and particularly when I used to teach, they don't really know. They have a vague sense that maybe something went wrong or people didn't like these governments or something. But the scope of the crimes is just absolutely unknown to most people. What's going on there? Well, it's not being taught. And I think one of the most horrific um, items, items I've seen is the upwards of almost a third of Americans generally, not just not just millennials, but Americans generally, believe that George W. Bush killed more people than Joseph Stalin. <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I shouldn't laugh, but uh, you know, how, how could you get to a point like that? Well, if in your university, all you learned in the early 2000s was Bush bad, Bush bad, Bush bad, Bush evil, Bush evil, Bush evil, and you learn nothing about the Cold War, nothing about communism. In fact, if you learn anything about the Cold War and communism, you learned about an evil Joe by the name of Joe McCarthy, right? Who, um, who went around persecuting all these good, progressive, loving liberals from the Hollywood 10 who were just out there making these nice movies. And by the way, they don't teach you, and uh, I include this in the Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism, a list of all 10 members of the Hollywood 10 and their Communist Party USA numbers, their five-digit Communist Party USA numbers. Those were presented when those people were called to testify before Congress on October 26 and 27, 1947. John Howard Lawson, Dalton Trumbo, everybody else, they quite literally swore a loyalty oath to Stalin's Soviet Union. That's when they when they joined the party. Most American communists don't become Communist Party USA members or didn't because they didn't want to swear a loyalty oath to Stalin's Soviet Union. The 50 to 100,000 who did were the really, really, really hardcore. So, but, but people don't know any of this. They don't learn any of it. They don't learn any of it in our crappy universities and our, in our government schools. I've seen this for years. I graduated from college the year the Berlin Wall fell. I was, I was a senior in 1989, 1990. Went to graduate school and the last 20 or 30 years, I've been giving talks to groups like ISI, Young America's Foundation, student groups all over the country, explaining to them, we're not learning these lessons. People are not talking about what happened in the Cold War. They're not learning why communism was bad. In fact, they're learning only good stuff. And occasionally I, I would have a liberal professor just sort of rolling her eyes at me, right? Like, okay, okay, Paul McCarthy, Ken Gore, settle down, settle down. But, but here we are now in the 2020s, and we've got astonishing numbers of people saying that they support communism or even socialism, which as Marx and Lenin said, Marx, Lenin, Engels said, socialism is the final transitionary step to communism. They don't even know that. So you know, we've uh, basically, we are reaping what we've sown in our schools. Well, therefore, people need to read the Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism. And younger <laughs> people in particular can read it because it is a page turner. There's nothing dense or difficult to get through. So I'm linking to the book at tomwoods.com slash 1909. And uh, Paul, thanks for your time. We'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, I'd love to, Tom. Anytime we should do it. Um, every October, we'll celebrate the anniversary of the great October revolution. Yes, indeed. Maybe we can uh, ruminate about these. So-called. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Paul. All right. Take care.
All right, folks, that's going to do it for today. Now, tomorrow, I've got our old friend Vijay Boyapati coming back on. He's got a brand new book called The Bullish Case for Bitcoin. And I'm going to ask him questions like, um, is it true that Bitcoin mining uses too much electricity, the way Elon Musk says? Also, I'm going to ask for some terminology. Like, explain what exactly is a fork? What do all these words mean that, you know, the Bitcoin people just use like they're nothing, but the rest of us don't know what on God's green earth they're talking about? We're going to do a lot of that tomorrow. It's going to be great. So make sure you tune in. And of course, come to the 2000th episode event in Orlando, October 16th, 2021. You are not going to regret that. We're going to have a ton of fun. And just think to yourself, if you're considering not going, just, just think. You just had over a year of your life taken away. And now here's an opportunity for a huge celebration where you're going to be surrounded by people who think the way you do, who never bought into the propaganda. You're going to have a wonderful night and it doesn't cost you anything. Entry is free into this event. This event is my gift to you. So check it out at TomWoods2000.com and I'll see you there. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.